So welcome again to Ask an Expert, Building on Your Foundations. My name is Carol Benedetti. I work at the CDC, and the CDC is a member of the Ask the Expert Planning uh, Committee series uh, by way of our general manager, Wendy Timpano. I would like to thank our committee and partners. The Planning Committee and the Ask, the Ask an Expert series is led by the County of Simcoe and Johanna Griggs. Thanks to their leadership, we were able to bring organizations throughout the county some excellent content to help you navigate the current environment. I would like to encourage you to keep your eye open for future sessions as well at simcoe.ca, Ask an Expert. Also, thank you to our regional partners who have assisted with these webinars. Of course, the County of Simcoe, but also the Small Business Center of Barrie, Simcoe County and Aurelia, South, Center, or South Georgian Bay Small Business Center, Enterprise Center, Aurelia Area CDC, that's us, Nottawasaga Futures, North Simcoe Community Futures Development, and the Center for Business and Economic Development. In terms of Q&A, we're gonna to try to have uh, plenty of time for you to ask your questions. Prior to today, several of you shared questions in advance. These were provided to our guest experts and many of the responses have been incorporated into their presentations. However, we are hoping to have a few minutes at the end for Q&A. So if you do have questions occurring to you during the presentation, please type them into the chat and you'll find that chat button at the bottom of your screen. We will address as many questions as we can after the presentation. I just want to now introduce our guest experts. I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to facilitate today's session on such an important topic. Our first presenter is Don Bourne, and he is someone who helps startup businesses and seasoned entrepreneurs make money. As an experienced small business owner, Don understands the practical reality of what it takes to launch, manage, and grow a business. He's a mentor and the Client Service Manager at the Henry Burnick Entrepreneurship Center in Barrie. Don is also a business consultant for the South Georgian Bay Small Business Enterprise Center, managing the starter and summer company programs. His volunteer work includes mentoring for futurepreneur and regional accelerators to support local economic growth in the community. Don delivers and designs workshops that help entrepreneurs build strong foundations for their business models. He believes in turning on the headlights through strategic planning, identifying the challenges and opportunities that lead to successful ventures. Our second presenter today, uh, expert, is Bart Nagel, egg and food entrepreneur. Bart is the general manager and co-founder of the recently launched local farmtodoor.ca. He owns and runs two agricultural operations, Bulbs of Fire and Bloom Remedy, which is cannabis cultivation. Uh, Bart moved to Canada from the Netherlands in 2006, looking for a life in the country. They bought an 1881 10 acre homestead in the hills, just north of Penetanguishene. And having a background in journalism, Bart's first stab at entrepreneurship was an online platform for Dutch immigrants covering working and living abroad. The entrepreneurial bug stuck and business ventures are Bart's true passion. So thank you to our experts, and I would like to turn it over to Don. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Carol, for that wonderful introduction. Um, sounds like I do a bunch of stuff, but actually, presently, I'm, I'm calling in from Germany. Uh, I'm, I'm hiking in the Alps. Took a break just to be part of this, and I'm so, uh, so um, honored to, uh, to be called an expert in this field. It's exactly what I do. I, I love helping entrepreneurs make money. So I'm going to share my screen and start a little bit of a presentation. Um, you can all see that. So it is Ask the Expert, building on your foundations. And I truly believe as an entrepreneur, there are some very key elements of any business in any sector in any industry um, uh, uh, that, that are foundational. And I'm going to touch upon those. Uh, before I'm going to let um, Bart speak, uh, we actually drew straws and I got the short one, so I get to go first tonight. Um, and I've known Bart for quite some time. He's got an amazing story. I'm sure you'll get uh, a lot of information out of that. So um, as Carol said, I am uh, the client service manager and mentor at uh, the Henry Burnick Center. I own a corporation called Born Principles Incorporated, and I do a lot of work with entrepreneurs, usually at the startup phase, but also at the scaling phase. And right now with COVID, 
Um, it's an extraordinary circumstance uh, and trying to work on innovative ideas uh, to help entrepreneurs um, grow, uh, at, at least uh, sustain, if not um, uh, thrive in, in the economy. And there are some really great stories and we'll touch upon those as I go through this. So you sent some pre-questions in and I broke them down into these categories. And as I go through this presentation, I'll weave some of the answers to these questions and how to adapt or pivot and diversify uh, in this extraordinary um, environment. Uh, your competitive advantage and, and how to improve it um, or on it. Um, consumer confidence, that's a big one right now. Uh, people going into uh, stores um, and, and you know, being concerned about uh, how things are being handled, etc. cetera. Uh, personal experience right now being in Germany, I'm seeing a lot of uh, <clears throat> wonderful things happen here. And I feel very, very safe. Uh, and areas that I don't see it is, is in the public areas, like in, on the beaches and things like that, which I'm staying away from. But in the stores and that, wearing masks and, and, uh, and whatnot, um, has really, I can see that the, the consumers are confident. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, consumer connections, how to better connect with um, your customers. Um, and it's something that I really, really believe in. Growth strategies, uh, how to grow in a, in a situation like this. Um, it is possible. Bart has a, a great story on that and I'll reinforce it. Online presence, absolutely a must in today's day and age. Uh, there's a, uh, a marketing prophet, the college, and he says, if you don't have a website, you're not in business. And I, I tend to believe that online presence isn't just a website, it's, it's all of the social media and other things that you do. And then where should you be spending your marketing dollars and how should you be spending it? So I always talk about turning on the headlights. And I think right now we're gonna talk about turning up the headlights. All of you are seasoned entrepreneurs, you're in business, um, and you're trying to improve your market share. And really, it's about the business planning. Um, and again, I say it's not about the plan, it's about the planning. You wanna make your business more effective, more efficient, and more profitable. And you know what, you really can't do that unless, well, to do it well, what you really need to is know your customer. Um, and I'm gonna ask all of you, you know, how well do you, it's rhetorical obviously, because we don't have a two-way conversation, but how well do you know your customer? Um, how intimately do you know them? Who are they? And what I tend to help entrepreneurs with is you break them down into segments. Um, you could have a, a business to business model where you're selling your product or service to a business. And you could also have a business to consumer model an end user where you're selling to them as well. Um, and you want to be able to identify them um, at such a granular level uh, to be able to connect with them and, and, and grow and, and understand what it is that they need and want. Um, I suggest creating an avatar uh, in some of the classes that I teach. I get the, the students to actually cut out a picture from a magazine or take it from online of their ideal or perfect customer. Who is that person? Give them a name, give them a persona. You may have heard that in, um, in, in the entrepreneurial world is your, your customer persona. And I challenge all of you, as I would any entrepreneur, is to list at least 50 attributes, 50 characteristics of these entrepreneurs, or sorry, of these customers. Um, who are they? What do they read? What do they do? What influences them? Get to know them so intimately, and I call it getting surgical. Um, know them at that level so that you can reach out to them, talk to them um, in, in their language, offer them products, services, value adds um, that they need and want uh, and, and to, to, to grow your business and to not just survive, but actually thrive. Um, the best way to do this, get into their shoes. Take a look at it from their perspective, your business, your industry, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, how do they see it? Not how you see it, you're, you're biased, you're in it, you're the entrepreneur, you're the one creating that product or service. Um, try to, to, to take yourself away from that and, and look at it from their perspective. Ask them questions. Why is it that they do things that they do? And what, uh, what influences their decisions? Um, and the better you understand that, again, the easier it is to grow your business. The second part of foundational planning is the value proposition. 
And this is kind of a chicken or egg. You've got the, the customer on one side and the value proposition on the other side. And I, I do a program called Further Faster. And uh, we, we kind of bounce this around and we've gone both ways. We've started with customer discovery and then we've gone to value proposition. It really doesn't matter. They're both absolutely critical foundations that hold their pillars that hold up your business. So what is your value proposition? What is a value proposition? It's a statement. It, it's what engages the customer. It helps them, helps communicate how you're going to improve their life. Whether it's a landscape person that's going to cut the grass, what really are they doing? They're not just cutting the grass. They're creating this outdoor living space that you can go out and enjoy. And, and so that you have the time and it's well manicured and you feel good about it. And um, I actually had a client that uh, their front page on their website was a woman and their, her daughter, about nine years old in a white, uh, white dresses rolling on the perfectly manicured lawn uh, with big smiles on their face. And that was what he did for people. And so that is really an essence of value proposition. It can be depicted by a picture as well. It helps them to recognize why they should choose you. You had a question about competitive benefit or competitive advantage. Um, we'll use that example with the landscape um, person, the person cutting the grass. And the typif typified uh, advertisement is someone pushing a lawnmower, whereas on your website or on the website of this individual, they had the, these two people just having a great time and enjoying life on this perfectly manicured lawn. He got so much business and, and so, um, so many good, good remarks uh, because he engaged them and it said, this is why you want to choose us. It's because we care about you and this is what we're going to do. And that picture just said everything, but you really want the statement. This is something that um, a lot of us kind of don't really think about. Crazy, this crazy busy decision makers don't care about what you're selling. They care about what it does for them. That's the value proposition. That's the thing that's on the front page of your uh, marketing material, how you're going to make their life better and, and why they would choose you. Talking about competition, are they adversarial or are they ally? In my business, I had a lot of competitors um, and over the years we became um, friends because we were in the same industry. We had the same profession and it, it, turned out to be very beneficial. At the very beginning of my business, people were really kind of worried and they were a bit adversarial. But as time went by, I realized that creating uh, an alliance with them was beneficial to both of us from getting better customers or I, if I didn't do something that my competitors did, I would send a customer to them and that customer would be happy. Um, so can you create allies with your competition? Can you build your industry? Uh, I think it's it's a critical piece right now, especially with COVID, as you know, you, the market share has has shrunk a little bit. But um, and and I think in in Bart's case with his story, uh, he'll be talking about how a number of uh, businesses came together with an innovative solution very quickly, uh, and and were able to increase their market share, increase their business, um, and, and increase uh, their their whole. Um, uh, outlook in, in the market space. So they asked me about business supports. There is a ton of business supports out there that you may or may not be aware of. You're, you're sitting watching Ask, Ask the Expert tonight, which means that you have some indication of some of these organizations. The Henry Burnick Entrepreneurship Center uh, at Georgian College is a, uh, an organization that helps um, startups and uh, growth businesses. We've helped businesses get into both national and international markets. Um, the Small Business Enterprise Center, both the Barry uh, and the South Georgian Bay um, SBEC. Uh, again, they have special programs like starter company, summer company programs, um, consulting. The thing in, because I'm at South Georgian Bay, I'll speak to that. Uh, we are actually in a business development center where we have the Collingwood Economic Development, the Downtown Business Association, um, the, the CDC, the Community Development Corporation, all under one roof. So when an entrepreneur walks in there with a problem, whether they're at an idea at startup phase or they've been in market um, and they're, they're going through COVID and they're trying to come up with some solutions or they need some resources, we're a one-stop shop. There is a number of uh, tremendous organizations out there. There's, there's the top three that I'm aware of. 
for mentoring, training, programs, resources, connections. Um, I also suggest that you get industry and or challenge specific mentors. My mentor, I was in the food industry, my main mentor was my brother-in-law who was an automotive mechanic. He taught me a lot about business, a lot about customer service, a lot about um, uh, the, 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 the intricacies of, of managing a, a small business. And um, he wasn't even in my industry. Uh, however, everything was, I call it cross-contamination or um, everything fit into uh, one another. And challenge specific mentors. What I mean by that is um, perhaps it's marketing. You need somebody in the marketing end of things uh, that may be an expert in that, uh, whether it's digital marketing or marketing in general. Uh, my, my other mentor that I had uh, of, of note was uh, one of the top marketing gurus in North America. And I was so fortunate. He walked through the door and started buying product from me. And I, I wooed him into being my mentor for 12 years. And I, and I believe that to be one of the reasons why I was successful um, for 22 years in the berry market. Um, and then other business supports would be your existing customers. You've got a customer base. Bart will talk about having a client list, a reach out list. Um, you not, even, not only want to know as much as you can about them, but you want to be able to talk to them about what problems or challenges are, there, are they having so that you can design solutions around that. One of the questions was, well, what, what about value adds? And my suggestion would be, if you talk to your customers, they're probably an active listen, by the way, just ask them questions and let them give you a, a ton of information, make mental notes, or like me, I need to write things down. Um, find out what other things can you bring to them? Um, maybe it's not in your industry. Maybe that becomes one of the alliances that you create with maybe one of your competitors that does something else similar, um, but maybe you can uh, uh, create a solution for your customer to increase your market share. So um, this is the end of my presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Bart. I just want to thank all of the different organizations for putting this series together. I think it's so critical to um, the entrepreneurs uh, and the business community, to economic development, to job growth, uh, that we have great organizations uh, to put these type of, of um, uh, programs together. Uh, I'm, I'll be still here, but uh, I'll, let, I'll let Bart talk about his things and then um, when we can field some questions. So I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen right now and turn it back over to Carol, I guess. Or Bart. Hi there, guys. Uh, am I on? You're on, Bart. You're all oh, good. Awesome. Um, well, thanks so much for uh, for having me and inviting me for this seminar. I'm glad to share uh, my experience in this um, in this crazy time, actually. Um, so yeah, farm to door. The reason why I've been asked to um, to share my experience today uh, is is the startup uh, farm to door that we launched in April. Uh, at the time, it was basically uh, pure necessity for us to, um, to to start this new venture. So farm to door is a local food delivery service based in um, in North Simcoe. We run out of an old butcher shop that we signed a lease for back at the end of May. Moved in there in June after we had a short uh, sprint and a collaboration with another business, downtown La Fontaine. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the background of, of Farm to Door. Um, my position uh, early in um, the, the COVID pandemic when it broke out, let's say mid-March, mid we were looking at it like, well, you know, our garlic farm, uh, the garlic is under the snow. Let's not worry too much and see what comes from it. But little by little, um, events got canceled. The earliest event that we always do is uh, the one of a kind show and then the Butter Tart Festival in, um, in Midland. We are a garlic farm that's in business for nine years now. Uh, typically running around four or five farmers markets a week. And then we do a whole bunch of events and uh, specialty shows throughout the year to extend the season and to, to reach a larger audience than we've ever could at local farmers markets. Um, so yeah, one of a kind show got canceled, then Butter Tart Festival got canceled. We started to clue in what was going down here. 
Um, and, and, and basically we've built a, a local food business that thrives around busy places. Uh, the more people, the more money we made. And basically that was all in jeopardy. Uh, at the same time, we saw a lot of companies, local food companies that, that had to shut down, um, grasping at the opportunity of delivery, which is, um, you know, like when we had the same problem, you can't go to your customer or your customer cannot come to you. You might consider the opportunity to go to them um, and, and, and make some money that way. Um, what we quickly saw, and this is where the collaboration came in, uh, friends of mine at Bell Roots Farms, we are currently uh, business partners in, uh, in Farm to Door, were doing that exact delivery and reached their audience pretty quickly, but it was like small scale. Um, but found out that it, yes, it brings in some money where you would otherwise not, not have access to it, but it's not all that profitable. And in the answer that we came up with is partnering up and trying to get as many local producers on one shop stop online store through which we would then assemble orders take orders online and uh, and deliver them to people's doors um, creating uh, much heightened access to local food uh, in a time where it was um, fairly non-existent it was uh, april and april is not typically local food season it's when bulbs of fire would typically start looking at, uh, you know, how do we kickstart the wholesale year? It wouldn't exactly be um, peak season. Um, anyway, so this, this idea came up early April and within three weeks we launched our web store and we've been uh, profitable from day one. Um, we added a location in Aurelia um, in, in July, and we opened a retail store at the location we were at uh, in North Simcoe in Perkinsfield at Balm Beach Road. Um, so the growth has been incredible, um, and, and, and the support of the community has been incredible. I remember the early, early day, well, four months ago, not, not that long ago, actually, where um, people were literally like cheering us on and thumbs up through the windows when we showed up with, with, with their delivery, their order, the, you know, their food that they paid for. And it was literally that heartwarming to, um, to receive that community support. But it also told us a lot about what was going on. Um, we pretty much saw uh, the importance that people felt to support local businesses in this difficult time. And uh, we also saw how much local food is actually appreciated when uh, you make it super easy. And I think in terms of this specific um, seminar, um, I think this is actually what we're, we're not actually sell. Well, yes, we're bringing local food around, but what we're actually doing is making something super convenient that would have been incredibly uh, inconvenient before. Um, and, and this is where we are thriving. Um, how inconvenient that was, I didn't realize until we st started this business. Um, for instance, typical local food buyers that, do attend the farmer's market have a window of four hours in a week, typically on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning or a Friday evening to do their local food purchases. And then it's like, see you next week. So if you feel like sleeping in or it's a rainy day, you don't want to go out, but you still like to eat local food, you just have no access. And um, so we came up with this model to which is basically, I saw one of the questions was uh, uh, e-commerce for locally based businesses. Now that's exactly what Farm to Door is. Um, a very curious case because Bulbs of Fire, for instance, use their e-commerce presence always to reach out to 
customers beyond the locality, beyond uh, the local reach, be, like people were too far away to come to you to the farmer's market or to our farm, so we could ship the stuff to them. Now we're using that very same model to, to reach a local clientele, but they have the convenience of ordering 24 seven. We see orders coming in at like 1.30 at night or you know, uh, 9.30 p.m. after any other store, especially sort of the high-end gourmet stores that, that, are, that carry our stuff, would have been closed. Um, and then we bring it to them three times a week. So the accessibility uh, was incredibly increased and um, the frequency of uh, the ability to obtain these local food items uh, was very much increased as well. Now, on top of that, we opened this local food store, uh, which, you know, does does really, really well, actually. And, and, and so having the store and uh, the online delivery system is, uh, is again, increased uh, convenience. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's dig into knowing your customer a little bit. Um, what I realized when uh, starting Farm to Door were a couple of things that, um, A, um, our clientele typically is well off. So we were not too worried about the fact that they would be in the same sort of crisis as... Um, as maybe lower income families would be or people that lost their jobs. Um, there's a lot of colleges in this area and, and, and the gourmet products that we bring typically cater to that, that higher income bracket. Um, and we sell food and people still need to eat. Um, realizing that, you know, local food is not always that easy. These people, uh, do still prefer uh, local food over, over grocery store food. Um, so those were a bunch of trends that we saw uh, when starting Farm to Door. I did not realize the extreme level of support that we would receive after launching this, but I definitely saw the basics that were there in order to, um, to launch this business. Um, I also think in terms of, I saw Don's presentation there with that puzzle piece, I think Farm to Door solved a few more problems. Um, obviously the two farm operations that came together, Bulbs of Fire and Bellwoods Farms, uh, had a, a very severe problem. Like our season was in jeopardy, uh, the access to our customer base was cut off. And so we were looking for a solution too. And if we are looking for that solution, there must be many, many more businesses that, that look, are looking for that exact same solution. Um, and so we reached out to all our friends and connections over the years on the farmer's market circuit to ask them to step on board. And initially we literally asked them for their products to on consignment because obviously there was no cash flow, there was nothing, there was just hopes and dreams and, and crazy ideas. Um, but yeah, with, um, with uh, about a dozen other producers, we, we ran through that first week and yes, yeah, slam dunking all the goals that we had set for like, let's say a month, month and a half later. So it's been, uh, it's been an incredible journey um, to step into this. It's, it's, you know we're we're lucky that we're collaborated with uh, with other businesses in the area uh, we're lucky to be able to start with a team because the the workload is intense it's sourcing local food is more of a challenge than uh, bulk buying a skid of whatever easy accessible stuff that's mass produced it requires a lot of you know touching base with producers, what do you have available, especially if you go to that three times a week delivery situation where then, because it's always limited supply, you have to replenish the stock online uh, pretty much every other day to not have your customer base come to this web store and find out that pretty much two thirds of the stuff is, uh, is sold out. So yeah, there's definitely some challenges to overcome, but we, we did cut out uh, a new path 
um, to our customer base in local food that I think will easily uh, survive um, the COVID situation. Um, because simply there were a bunch of trends already pointing at that local food delivery uh, is not new. If you look on Amazon, the amount of food products that are available there, if you look at all the businesses that do these chef assembled um, meal kits, um, you know, there's trends there that, that point in this direction. And I think if you, if, if, if you're in this market, in the local food business, for the length of time that we are in, then you see the level of appreciation and 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 um, the people craving top quality, top quality being local, fresh, uh, less miles traveled, higher nutrition. Um, that that is what uh, what 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 is the driving force behind this? The love of food is still there. Uh, I don't think it ever um, even diminished. It just we as a local food movement only clued in to um, to the current buying habits that require a much um, a much more elevated uh, service level and convenience level than the four hours a week at the farmers market. Um, with that. I'll hand it over to Dawn or one of the moderators for questions. If there are any topics you want me to touch upon, please uh, fire away. You know what I like about that part is, is it's not just a success story for the consumers, but it's a success story for the farmers and the local businesses. Um, it's, it's, like a, it's a double-edged win-win um, solution. It was innovative. And I always say the event is the catalyst for change. And I want to point out to everybody here is Bart is, uh, he's a gregarious personality, but he's as humble as humble pie could be. Um, you know, he, he, he talks about, you know, how he just kind of flew by the seat of his pants. It's not really um, accurate. And I'm going to, I'm going to put him on the spot here for a moment, because if you were to ask Bart who his customer is, I, I bet you he could tell you exactly who that customer is, both the small business and the end user um and so don't be so humble will you? um yeah i think i think that we go back to those foundational aspects and and you talked about uh, the value that you were bringing um to not just the consumers that wanted farm fresh local good produce but the farmers that were in this covid situation and i look at some of these questions um i think the first one was how can a tourism business pivot during uh, COVID and stay open and stay profitable. Um, you know, a tourism based business is, is going to be a real challenge because you're going to get people coming together. Um, and what I'm seeing here in Germany is, is really unique. Um, I was uh, in a cable car uh, the day before yesterday going 2000 meters up in an Alp uh, and, and they had all of the protocols in place with masks and sanitizers and everything else. And, they may have been, they may be doing a little less um, business uh, turnover of amount of people, but they're doing really good quality uh, type of business. People are going up there uh, and wanting to experience. So I think tourism, you do have an ability to um, um, put procedures in place that are going to make consumer confidence, uh, make them feel well. You know, you go to farmers markets and, and there's, there's going to be some people that don't want to go into a public place. Uh, and, and so Bart, you created a solution around that. Um, and I think tourism can do the same thing. Um, I, I don't know if you want to add anything to that one, Bart. Um, yeah, um, yeah, tourism. Um, so at Bulbs of Fire, we do a, a, a bunch of things uh, that are ag tourism related every year, except this one. So um, for, for tourism, so we do an annual garlic dinner at the farm. We do a bunch of tours and luncheons every year. For this year, we opted to cancel it um, because of the reason that if, if you want that small setting, uh, that country setting that we always have offered in, in the ag tourism events that we've put on, then the, it just 
drops below the, the threshold of profitability. Um, so, yeah, I saw that first question too. Um, if you cannot do it profitable, I would actually opt to not do it at all and find something that works. Um, there's sure. another question that I saw where, um, that's actually the number two question, which is I, I think the most important question that I saw come by is how can small businesses still experience growth in the face of COVID-19? And the simple answer to that is by selling something that people will buy. Um, and if well, you're in- Bert, If I can interrupt, Bert, how do you know what people want to buy? Well, they kind of have to know your customer. <laughs> that, was, that was a setup, man. That yeah, was, no, that was, that was a, an assist, they call that, an assist. Um, yeah, like um, you have to find something that ties in with your business that can keep you afloat. Um, in our case, it's not that hard, like people still eat, right? Like, so we, we just had to find a way in which they wanted to receive their local food. In a tourism business, um, I know some agricultural tourism business that veered a little bit more to the food side because um, local food got so much attention in this spring. Um, for instance, Ron's Ranch is one of these businesses near Elmville um, that used to do all these uh, mazes and uh, corn mazes, that kind of stuff. And uh, right now I see their fields full of uh, winter squash. Um, so, you know, like when, when there is such an uptick in, in sales for a lot of local food producers, um, then that's an easy switch as an agricultural business with a tourism focus to veer back to the, to the ag side and produce food. Um, I would not know exactly how, uh, for instance, Blue Mountain would do it if their business is selling ski experiences and, you know, filling those chairs that go up that hill, if you can only fill half of them. But, you know, like you have to come up with something that, uh, you know, fits in this, in this time frame to, to make, you know, to, to, to get you by, um, just to, just on that point, I've seen businesses like yoga studios um, that started doing online um, yoga classes. And, and the big question is, well, there's a plethora of stuff on YouTube that people can, can get, you know, free yoga stuff. Why would they want to be, um, you know, still going to their yoga studio uh, virtually and, and doing yoga? And I think that goes back to creating that customer connection. You, you know your customers, having that conversation you know, I, I go out into the market space and bulbs of fire and Bart Nagel and your wife and uh, even your kids, um, people speak very highly of you because you've made that connection. And I know that when I go to the berry farmer's market or pre-COVID, um, I owned a, a bakery called Shea Berry Bakery. And I still walk into the berry farmer's market and a lot of my customers um, still go to the berry farmer's market or my past customers, they say, and, and they say, Shea Dawn, where's the butter tarts? You know, the, that connection um, is, is absolutely critical. So you might be able to offer um, something virtually uh, to, to augment or, or value add because you've created that connection or that relationship with, uh, with your customer. Much like you, Bart, when I see you at, um, uh, what is it, the one of a kind show, uh, you know, there's tens of thousands of people going through that, um, that venue, uh, but people recognize you. Um, because you've created that connection, that relationship. And I think that's a critical piece. So even Blue Mountain, I'm sure that they have connections and they'll, they'll come up with some, um, you know, strategies. But you're right, they're, they're probably going to be at half speed with regards. And I think that's just the nature of the beast. Um, and that's where we go from survive, can you thrive if you come up with some other opportunities? And you, don't, you can't do that unless you know your customer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that connection is definitely true. And especially um, a, a friend of mine actually uh, has a yoga studio, which I've been attending over the years. They switched to a lot of uh, online stuff. Um, 
right now they're running at half speed too because they need to do social distancing in those yoga studios um but yeah it's all about that connection would i um did i do a lot of online yoga no but if i did it it was definitely with them because of that connection right so um, um yeah you don't just switch to a new supplier because all of a sudden you know that business ha has to shut down for a while you just wait it out the customer waits it out like they they want you to thrive too um i think especially with local businesses there uh, and which we have seen through farm to door that there is so much more local support from the community that you ever thought possible if you go out on a limb now and and come up with something that 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 might answer to their needs, you'll, you'll be surprised how much support you get because they want you to succeed too. Everybody realizes that um, if we do not buy local now or suppose, support all these businesses, they might not be there in a year. And uh, what does Main Street look like then? Something I don't really want to think about uh, and customers definitely realize that right now. But on the upside, a good segue to, uh, to the one question that I wanted to speak to is um, how important is setting aside a marketing advertising budget when doing a business plan? Um, and, and again, COVID-19, uh, how much money should you be putting aside for marketing and advertising? That relationship that you have with that customer is built around having conversation with your customer. Bart, you have a, a mailing list um, uh, that you... Uh, send constant um, uh, messages to your customer, more personalized, if you will, uh, because it's coming directly to their inbox and they've accepted that um, on top of your social media and, and other online presence. And I think a lot of businesses that do that and do it well um, are creating that connection and, and building those relationships. They're talking specifically to them. Um, and I'll, I'll, the segue just here to a, a little piece that I call micro hiring. And that's, you may not be the greatest content writer. You may not be the, the social media uh, person that can increase your SEO and use all these wonderful acronyms they use in the digital world. You don't understand them. And it's like, it, it becomes confusing. Um, however, micro hiring somebody uh, to do that for you at this particular time fits into that marketing budget. Um, I, just a short little, very quick story. In 1992, my business experienced um, uh, a, a downturn in the marketplace globally and, and regionally. The city of Barrie lost two very large uh, employers. Um, I was at the top of the food chain and my marketing um, mentor turned around and he says, I want you to triple your marketing budget. And I said, well, how, where's that money going to come from? He says, I don't care, but you need to triple it. And this is what you need to do. And it was reaching out to my existing customers, letting them know that I was alive that I was thriving, that I was doing okay, and there was lots more reasons for them to come and see me, also asking them what more would they would want and having that conversation. And that's exactly where my marketing went, was creating the conversation. And I spent a lot more money, three times the amount, which I didn't have. But when the recession was over, I came out on the top of the, uh, against all the comp competition out there because I was the person to go to. I was the one on top of mind. So I think when it comes to you know, how much money should you spend in marketing at, at a, in a downturn of an economy, even in an extraordinary circumstance like COVID, I think you should never stop having that conversation or don't, don't pull back on your marketing budget, figure out a way. And with today's day and age, if, you know, 1992, there wasn't the internet that we have today, there wasn't the social media, having that conversation is so much easier. Um, uh, but it has to be relevant content. It has to be revolved around what is it that the customer needs, wants, values? What can they afford? Have that conversation, um, and you're gonna you're gonna be okay. I think you'd be okay. And it doesn't think, matter yeah. if it's a tourism industry or an ag industry or uh, you know uh, a service industry. I think it's all the same. Yeah, um, I think marketing now is incredibly important, and uh, especially when we're now in the situation with social distancing and 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 and, and the stores ask for face masking and a lot of people don't like it so they they like to stay home more so your your online tools to do so are pretty much your go-to and 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 all these apps that we are currently using in our online business like shopify uh, mailchimp uh, facebook advertising they all give you incredible data on what works and what doesn't work and 
pretty much the moment you've sent it out, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you can look at like, how well did my email do? Like how much money did we make with this email? How well did this new product uh, do that we pitched today? Uh, and so you slowly learn um, to, to tune in to your customer needs. I, I think pretty much every business venture you step in is uh, a clean slate and you have to start learning from day one. Uh, for farm to door too, you, you, we stepped in, we knew a bunch of things, but you also go like, hey, we have a lot to tune in and a lot to catch on to right now uh, to give you this, the simplest example that we're trying to solve. In our retail store, um, we do about half the average purchase value of what we do online. And um, so then we figured, hey, you know what? Like there's only so much people can carry in their hands. So let's provide some shopping baskets. And we bought a bunch of shopping baskets and uh, set them in different spots in the store. And it turns out that people really don't like to pick up shopping baskets. So now we've got to figure out how to direct them to pick up these shopping baskets in order for them to put more stuff in their baskets in order for our average purchase value to go up. And, 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 and this is also what I enjoy mostly about entrepreneurship is to, to put in front of these challenges and to, to find these, these gears and buttons to, to make your business work and thrive. And, um, I think if you have to pivot into a new product or a new offering or a new value add, you're going to be put in front of these challenges time and time again, and you just pick up the cues, learn from it and tune in. You, you just brought up a really co good point. We call them KPIs or, or key performance indicators. You know, you put something out there and you want to be able to collect that data to evolve your innovation, your strategy, and you, know, you may not know everything. You start with an assumption and you start doing your due diligence to figure it out, whether it's a basket solution or, you know, how do you get more customers through the door? But you've got to, you've got to understand, is this working? Is it not? One of the things that, um, uh, that I try to put forward is any marketing you do is you have some form of a, a tracking device. Uh, nowadays in, in social media, it's, it's likes and shares. You know what? For me, it's not likes and shares, it's conversions. You may have a lot of people looking at your website or your social media, but how many people are you actually getting through the door that's giving you their hard earned dollars? That's the key, key metric that you're trying to capture, um, whether or not it's a good campaign, whether it's good content, um, a good value proposition, et cetera. Um, I was just told by Johanna, we've got about three, four minutes left. Um, Carol, was there any more questions that came in? Yeah, I mean, I feel like you didn't even need a facilitator for this session. You guys have done such a great job addressing all the questions, but there, there's a couple of things that maybe haven't been covered. Um, you were talking about businesses who um, are practicing safe practices, you know, the yoga studio, etc. How do you strike that right tone where you, you communicate the need for these practices, but you're not making people fearful? Uh, you know, I think there's two camps when it comes to our consumers. We've got the ones that don't really care um, and, and will walk around without a mask and not worry about it because they're indestructible. That's usually the younger millennial group. And I'm just generalizing uh, and I know I shouldn't, but um, that's what I see. Uh, and then you have the ones that are fearful, the ones that will not go out. And I think that goes back to communicating the message about being open and authentic about the problem and what your solution is. And then talking to the customers to make sure that um, they not only understand what you're doing, but do you understand what their concerns are um, and is masks enough or uh, limiting three people in the store, is it enough? Or do they want more personalized service? And if they want more personalized service, then give it to them. Mm -hmm. Create a situation. I remember on Friday nights, people going to the cottage and Barry was the gateway to cottage country. People just wanted to get through the gate. They wanted to hurry up and relax. So stopping at the bakery to pick up whatever it was, was, was not convenient. But I had so many customers that would drive all the way back down from Muskoka on a Saturday to pick stuff up. And I said, this is ridiculous. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay open or stay there on Friday. You give me your order. I'm gonna create it for you. And I'm gonna be there for you or have somebody there. For you to pick it up, it, it, much like what Farm to Door has already did. And I did this back in 1989, um, a long time ago. 
and and that they loved it and and that actually became almost wildfire because everybody in Muskoka said oh you got to stop at Shea Berry on the way to get your Chelsea bun at the cottage because you can't be at the cottage without a Chelsea bun seriously um, no, we just we just bring it to them Don. well yeah so you bring it to them now man I you know like I had an old Volkswagen or something I can't remember what I owned at the time it wasn't possible but I just stayed open longer and and, and listened to the customers so when it comes to um, you know, their concerns about uh, the safety and whatnot. I think, you know, listen to all the experts that are out there with COVID-19, preparing your store, um, uh, taking advantage of some of the, the offers that are out there. Um, we were talking about this before the, the program started. There's the RT07 um, with uh, COVID preparedness for tourism-based businesses, up to $1,000 for PPEs and whatnot. Um, I saw something really cool today. There was a uh, the people at the grocery store here in Germany had clear um, PPEs, so they were coming across the top, cool. open at the bottom. You could see their mouths and that, but they were they were protecting from moist speaking, um, and uh, you can breathe properly. And it was, it was a great idea. Um, Germany is usually a little bit ahead on innovation from time to time, uh, but that, it was the first time I saw it, and customers loved it. They were saying, "Well, that's really cool." Mm -hmm. I think also uh, to, to tie into this, I think also uh, if you uh, now we run this retail store, if you simply abide by the protocol that's been set and, and, and not over uh, exaggerate and just abide, people know by now, I think um, the you know, people know they have to walk in with a face mask. They know all the baskets and everything you touch is being wiped down. Well, if you show you're doing that, then it's fine. Like people are used to it. I think the fear is, is kind of subsided because it settled in and like four or five weeks ago. It was, well, they're doing this and there they're doing a whole other approach, which makes people nervous about the other place, but not this place. I think we're past that. And, um, we, we don't even touch upon it really. Uh, there's a few signs that says what you need to do. And for the rest, it's like, sure. There's a window covering at the counter and there's free face masks available and, um, you know, max 10 people in the store. That's it. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's one question here that's um, a little bit complex, but I, I'd kind of like to hear what you have to say. How uh, can I diversify and look at new offerings, revenue streams, and still maintain a focus on my core offerings? What key factors sh should I consider when looking to diversify? For and me, I know you're going to say because you know your customer, right? Bottom line is if you're going to diversify, what do the customers need, want, what do they value, what can they afford? So if you, if you want to build your business out, if you want to scale your business up, then any of the solutions that you um, are going to create for them have to be determined by them. Um, and then you have to have the means and the abilities. And I'll go back to Bart's humble pie. Um, he said that, you know, opening up farm to door, he didn't know what the heck he was doing. I, I call that BS. Um, I've seen him start up his bulbs of fire and bloom. I've seen him in the market space. And all of those were transferable skills. So he had the means to do what farm to door um, the solution was because he had all that experience in the back. And I think entrepreneurs have a lot of experience. All they need to do is figure out what the customer needs and then create that solution for them. Look at, um, there's a, a manufacturing um, tooling place in, um, in Oro and, and the name is escaping me. But when COVID started, they retooled their whole shop and started making PPEs. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it was a, a, a tremendous, uh, success because they they were adaptive and they were listening to the market space and rvh needed ppas and and uh, a lot of the frontline workers needed them and they they saw hey well we can retool we can still do our normal line which is not going to be all that needed right now in this economy but we can retool and and diversify and create something else i think napoleon stoves is another one that diversified their product line um you know it's it's what do the customers need and want Bart? Yeah, there's a, a few of my uh, entrepreneurial connections that uh, have switched to there. and uh, But they obviously had the opportunity to switch to like very obvious COVID needs like BD's distillery, uh, switch to uh, hand sanitizer. Uh, one of my farmer's market friends um, 
uh, baggy, she, she always makes these lounge pens and baggy pens, uh, and she switched to like making face masks. Um, and you know, and is still at the farmer's market and is probably still going to do um, one of a kind with exactly that product um, where we just had to step back. So like um, there's, there's, I think there's many opportunities if you're open to them and open to like either parking or putting what you're currently doing on a, on a, on a slow burner and, and, and finding other avenues that, that may answer better to the current demands that are out there. Look at your competitors as well. See what they're doing. Um, some of the solutions that they, you know, they may be one step ahead of you, but can you can you follow on their coattails? Maybe you can do something better. Uh, I, I, just a short story. Um, the city of Barrie grew very quickly. It was the fastest growing community in Canada for about 12 years straight. Um, and I saw a lot of, I saw recessions, I saw growth. Uh, it was interesting, but we went from a, uh, what I call geriatric farmer demographic to a bedroom community of Toronto, uh, which was a completely different demographic, different uh, needs and wants. And my business needed to pivot. I just kept asking the customers, what do you want? My product line in year 17 looked completely different than it was in year five um, as it evolved. And, and I diversified my line. For seven years, I ran a connoisseur connection because people wanted clotted cream and beluga caviar and, and local infused oils and, and stuff like that. And I carried it for a while until it became the norm in the large retailers. And then I took it away and I said, nope, I'm not doing that anymore. So you're always looking for, as all entrepreneurs do, is looking for those opportunities that we can capitalize on. Mm -hmm. So this has been fantastic. I think your enthusiasm, both of you, is, is really catching um, and that's amazing. Uh, if there's one message I took away from this is how important your connection to your customer is. Um, maybe when you're super crazy busy, you don't have as much time to nurture that connection as, as you, you could. So maybe now's an opportunity to take advantage of the extra time that you have and really concentrate on that. So I, I thank Carol, you so much for all the information. Carol, I, you know, I just want to add to that just for a moment. I got to tell you that it is a great time to open a business and, and build a business and evolve your business because you can take that time to do the due diligence that's absolutely so critical uh, in building strong foundations because you can't right. build a house on, on no foundations and the same thing goes for business. That's yeah. right. Excellent. So thank you again to our two experts, Don Bourne and Bart Nagel. That was fantastic, guys. Um, I want to thank everyone else for attending. A couple of things to note just before we close the session. We're going to be sending a survey out um, by email along with the recording of the session. So keep an eye open for that. Um, if you're interested in hearing from more experts, the information about the series again can be found at simco.ca forward slash ask an expert. Um, thank you to the County of Simcoe and all of the partners involved. Wishing everyone a fantastic rest of the day or in Don's case evening and take care and stay safe.